right, so in this week's guitar lesson, we're gonna learn how to play an acoustic ragtime blues that you can play by yourself. You don't need a jam track for this, and it sounds great on its own, so this is something you could perform for other people, or you could just sit and play it by yourself, but it's also got the added benefit of all the, the fretboard theory, sort of what's going on with the chord shapes and the notes that are played and how it all fits together. And so I'm gonna explain all of that uh, as we get into this lesson, which is split into two parts. So in this video, we're gonna go through the first half. If you'd like to watch the second half, download the tablature, access the on-screen tab viewer. You can get all of those extra things by going to activemelody.com, go to the weekly lessons page, and do a search for EP534. All right, so I'm calling this week's lesson Ragtime Blues because I wasn't really sure what else to call it. It's not Delta Blues, and it's not Chicago Blues, so it's it's somewhere in that sort of ragtime kind of vibe. And to me, this has a, a sort of a Bessie Smith sound. So if you like the chord arrangement on this, where you're borrowing chords from other keys and kind of putting it all together, listen to Bessie Smith, the, the piano uh, behind Bessie Smith. It, uh, you know, I, I love those arrangements, and so this is sort of my attempt at trying to sound like so it's in the key of G and our first chord is a G um, and actually the way that I wrote this thing I started off with a G chord is just sitting around the house playing like I always do sitting on the couch and then I went like this and I was thinking more like a Spanish style that's what I was originally thinking but what I discovered was if I, if I play that G7, so it's just a G bar chord using the E shape, take your pinky off, and then you've got a G7. You've got that flat seven in there. But uh, when you take your pinky off, it allows you to do things like this. Right, and so you can get that 13 or six sound. So I'm playing, uh, putting my pinky on the fifth fret, second string to get that sound. And this is what I love though. If I play that for the G and slide down, and then I hit that same note, that fifth fret second string. In this case, when you slide it down, uh, you're playing a G flat chord or an F sharp, but that note becomes the flat seven. In that case, so you get a dominant seven, you know, kind of bluesy sound. So when you put it together, you have that kind of sound. And so the way that I started this starts by sliding in that chord, and I played it like this. So slide in, second uh, string, pinky down on the fifth fret, second string, and then an upstroke on the first string. So, all right, now you slide it down to the G flat or the F sharp and go. Hitting that same note with your pinky. But I just love the sound of that, uh, going from the one chord down a half step, and then I go back up to the G. Uh, but when I go back up, I'm not playing any more chords. So that's actually the only chords I'm strumming, at least in this first half of this. Uh, from here on out, it's gonna be mostly single string stuff. Let's listen to that. So the way that I played that goes. Let's get that part first. So that's the G. So that represents the G. We didn't strum a G chord, but I played. Now, how does that represent a G? Let's get our bearings here. This is uh, the stuff that I want you to understand this. Don't just memorize these notes so that you can apply this to other things when you're improvising. So think about your G chord here, using the E shape, and think about the top three strings, this little triad. That's where I'm at. And I'm also thinking about the major pentatonic scale, pattern two which is right here, right? So I, I slid in. So that makes sense now. It's really just G major pentatonic scale, but that's where it's coming from is that chord shape. So slide in on the third string, and then we go three, five, three on the second string, and then we come up to the first string and play three, five. So. Now at this point, the song goes to an E. So we're going from a G to an E. Now I realize that E major is actually not in the key of G. It would be, if you were playing an E chord, it would be an E minor. That would be relative minor of G, in fact. 
but you can borrow chords, and that to me is the Bessie Smith sound, the ragtime sound. It's full of uh, secondary dominant chords and borrowing chords from another key. You're gonna see why this E works in just a second, but for now, just know that that's the next chord, is the E. So after the G, this is what I played. Now you can hear that E come out, even though I didn't play an E chord and there's no E uh, bass note or anything underneath it. You can hear the E being uh, highlighted because from this G, sliding up to that fourth fret on the first string from the third to the fourth fret, that's playing the third interval of my E chord, and here's where I'm at mentally, this is what I'm picturing. My E chord right here using that D shape. So think, this is getting into the cage system thing, but think of your D chord in first position, slide it up two frets, and you're playing an E chord. Now here's the, the order of notes though, this is the important part. This is the way you can remember this shape. The second string, if you think of that as a little triangle, the tip of the triangle, that's the note that defines the chord. So that's my E note. Therefore, up here on this first string, that's the third interval of the chord. So first interval, third interval, and then down here is the fifth interval. So you just have to remember that order. You have to kind of commit that one to memory. So if you're playing this chord shape, whatever is the point of that triangle, um, that's the name of the chord. So, but I slid into the third, so. And then strings one and two, which are in your E chord, right? And then down to your open third, to the third interval of that E chord down here. It's just an octave lower than up here, right? So we're gonna come to the first fret, third string. It's the notes from your E chord, right? It'd be like playing your E chord and just lifting your index finger. So hopefully you can see all of that E stuff that's happening, you know, as we're playing these notes. Starting here. Okay, so after this, then I came up to back to the first string open, and then watch this. So it's open one, and then we come down to the second string and play three, one, open, and then down to the third string and play the second fret. Now what is that? That sounds different, right? That's got a different vibe. That's where the song goes to an A minor chord. So at that point, we're playing an A minor. So that E chord makes more sense now because E is the five chord of A minor. So all that E chord was, was a secondary dominant chord. I'll put a lesson up on the screen if you wanna know more about secondary dominant chords. It's a great lesson in, in a deep dive on that very topic. But basically, the E chord is your five chord of your A minor. And that happens all throughout music. You create a little extra tension and then release that tension. That's all music is in the end anyway. It's just a series of tension and relief. So if we're looking at the chords of this song, we start off with the G, go down a half step to the G flat. We go back to the G and then we play our E and now we're on the A minor. All right, so from that E, those notes then are just notes from the A minor scale. It sounds kind of minor, right? Now when I played that, I went ahead and played that second fret third string with my ring finger so that I could play the A minor chord like that. So it's, right? I wanted to go ahead and strum the chord to give us more definition as to where we are in the song. So then the song stays on that A minor and the next thing I played was up here, I went, So, all of that represents my A minor because the song stays on the A minor. So remember, we played our A minor here. That was the last thing we played. Now I'm mentally, and even though I'm not playing this chord, this is where I'm thinking about. So I came up into this neighborhood. It's my A uh, minor chord uh, using the E minor shape. So these two fingers uh, on the seventh fret would be like your two fingers if you play an E minor. I'm just capoing with my finger on the fifth fret. So that puts me into that region. And I play this. 
And those notes would be, there's a couple of ways you can look at it. I, I'm thinking more like Dorian mode. Um, I know that off of this E minor shape, and this will be a big takeaway for some of you. Um, a, an easy way to find Dorian is look at this little pattern. Very symmetrical. On the first string, it's eight, seven, five, and you do the same thing on the second string, eight, seven, five. Then you come down to the third string and play seven, five, four, and do the same thing on the fourth string. So you have. You've seen that before, right? I'm sure I've talked about that in other, uh, other videos, but if you connect it to this chord shape, you can see that that runs right through it. That's a quick and easy way to find Dorian mode. So anyway, I just wanted to, that's kind of what I'm thinking about when I play these next notes. So it's seventh fret down to the fifth fret on the first string, and then we're gonna reach up here to the eighth fret second string with our pinky, and then come down to the fifth fret second string, and then the Th uh, fifth fret third string and then we're gonna go down to the fourth string and play seven five so all together it goes but think about that as being a minor stuff a uh, minor Dorian really Dorian mode out of this position and then the song goes to a D7 and I played it right here using that C7 shape. So think of your C chord in first position, just slide it up two frets, and then add your pinky to the fifth fret third string. Play those middle four strings. If you don't know this chord voicing, you've got to learn this one. If you play any blues, it's in everything. And it's easy to play. It's like easy to get under your fingers. That's why I love it. You can slide it around. It's just a very, very cool and useful um, chord shape. And here's how you can find it. Where, whatever your ring finger is playing, whatever note that is, that's the name of the chord, so it's a D7. All right, so after that little A minor run, I came down and went And that's just playing that D7. But what gives it that sound is coming to the third interval of the chord first. So we're on the fourth string, we go three, four, and then I put my index finger on that third fret second string. So you get that harmonized sixth sound. And then ring finger down here on the uh, fifth fret fifth string, and then my pinky falls into place on the fifth fret third string. So I basically just built that chord, but we kind of did it out of order. So I played it like this. Now I find it easiest to pick and then pluck that second string with my index finger, or with my ring finger. That's just easier. You don't have to do that. You can pick it all, but that's what I'm doing. And then after that D7, I played this. And I got that from George Harrison. I, there was, uh, I think, Devil in the Deep Blue Sea. There, that lick is in that song somewhere, I'm pretty sure, in the little guitar break. Uh, I don't think George actually played it. There was somebody else, but... Uh, anyway, um, what I'm doing for that 5th fret 2nd string down to the 3rd fret 3rd uh, string. And those two notes would be, there's different ways you could think of it. They could be from like an augmented chord or kind of like like that diminished 7, which is very George-esque. So it'd be like that D chord and then that diminished 7. But I'm not playing the full chord, I'm just playing. Right, and that gets me back into right back into the G. And it's because D is the five chord of G. So you can see that what we're doing really is just a series of tensions and releases. The E is tension, which resolves to the A minor. And then the D is tension, which resolves to the G. You can hear that, right? So, played that same little lick, like the same way we played it in the intro. Now the only difference is I didn't play the full chord. I just played the triad, it's actually easier. Slid into the fourth fret third string. And then came down and played the same G flat or F sharp. This time I'm just playing strings uh, one, two, three, and four. So I'm not playing the, doing the full bar. I'm just, just taking advantage of those top four strings. You don't need to do all of them. And I played it like doing, lifting my pinky here on that fifth fret, second string. All 
Okay, so then the song goes back to the G chord, and here's what I played. Right? So I did the same little walk up that we've been doing. Kind of like the G run in bluegrass. Sort of like a version of it. Um, so started with that. And then let's look at this. What is this? You should be able to pause the video and work out what this is. This is, I'll assume you've done that. I'll give you a chance. This is another voicing for your G chord, right? It's your G. It's your G using that D shape. I'm repurposing a lot of the stuff we've already done here. So I'm up here, but I'm only playing strings one and two. I don't need the full chord. Right? Now what's the next chord after that? We're just going through the same cycle. The next chord was the E, remember? So what I do very quickly in my head uh, is I ask myself, where's the nearest E? We're gonna do it, we gotta do E stuff now. So I don't wanna come all the way down here, that's too far. I'm already in this position. Oh yeah, there's an E chord right here. Right? It's the E chord using the A shape. And if you look at the top three strings, it's right up here. In fact, I don't need that. I'm just gonna stay on strings one and two like we did with a G chord. So if you look at all that's happening is my, actually my index finger stays down on that uh, seventh fret uh, first string. But then my, on the second string, I slide up to the ninth fret to get that E sound. And without playing the chord, you can hear it. You can, you can hear where we are in space. And actually, after that, uh, once I got to the E, I walked it down like this. And what that's doing is it's walking it to an E7 chord. Because I'm going to that flat 7. So now I come down to strings 2 and 3. They're both in the same fret, on the 9th fret. And then I'm going to do this. I'm going to keep one finger on the 9th fret 2nd string while I walk the other one down to the flat seven. It's just an E7 chord, but I'm only playing strings two and three. And I just walked it down like that. And then the song goes back to the A minor. So I just played the top three strings here on the fifth fret. That's enough of an A minor, right? That is an A minor. It's just the top part of that shape, but I can move around by not playing the full chord. So I walked it up. Seventh fret up to the eighth fret on the first string. So. Then remember after that A minor, we play the D. And so what I did was I hit the open D string, open fourth string, bar the first three strings this time on the seventh fret, and that represents a D uh, six chord. I've talked about this in many, many lessons. There's my D chord using the A shape, D six, D nine. So I just went. Added that note while I played the bar, that's the eighth fret first string. That's That would be like a D seven, using that A seven shape. Hopefully you're starting to connect all of this up. And then back to my G, down here. And then five, or I went to the four chord, which you would normally do, right? You play the, the one chord, you play the four, and then that gets you back. You hear that all the time. But one of the things that happens sometimes in music, you play the four minor. So that's what I did, I played a C minor. And that's using the A minor shape, but I'm playing it here. I'm barring on the third fret. And I just arpeggiated the chord and then back to my G.
All right, so that's the first half of this composition. Come to Active Melody and join us for part two, where we'll go over the second half. There's a whole new set of chords in that second half, and you would have access to the tablature and the on-screen tab viewer, so you can slow things down, you can loop sections and all of that. And if you haven't checked out Active Melody, I would encourage you to do so. I have many, many years worth of uh, in-depth lessons like this, and they're all designed to help you improvise. All right, we'll see you in part two.